Welcome to the Psychic Holistic Spotlight. I'm Bill Haney, your host tonight with my associate, Josie Way. And today we're gonna to be going for a little journey along the paths and fields with Brett Mayette. He's gonna be sharing with us information about what most people would consider weeds, but are actually wild edibles. Uh, some of them you can prepare for just in salads, some you can add in soups, some you can make pickles out of pickle, pickle vegetables. So mm. again, Brett Mayette, good to see you again. How Thank are things you. going? Wonderful. Thank you for having me, and uh, it's nice to be here. Well, this is a, a great topic to, to be talking about. Um, it won't be long before a lot of these weeds will be popping their leaves and the heads of flowers, and, uh, and later on in the season, a lot of roots are used for uh, fortifying our, our organs and our health system. So I'm going to let you just uh, share with us what you would consider some of the more identable flowers and leaves and weeds that uh, are very, very beneficial for our, our system. Um, you know, many thousands of years, humans have been foraging for these um, plants and it's part of their diet has kept them healthy, and so where would you like to start? Well, um, like you just mentioned, uh, prior to the age of agriculture, humans were hunter-gatherers. We just walked around and foraged and ate whatever we could get our hands on. So mm -hmm. back then, many thousands of years ago, we had a very diverse diet um, when the age of agriculture started. Um, and people were stationary in villages and um, you know, eventually towns and so on. Uh, we started cultivating plants and so on. But so anyway, we're genetically wired to eat a wide variety of uh, plants. Um, there is a multitude of different plants in nature that are highly nutritious, nutrient dense. And I really focus on um, the most common ones that grow in vegetable gardens, perennial gardens, mm -hmm. along disturbed, uh, disturbed clean lots, even vegetable farms and, mm -hmm. and so on. And they are, <clears throat> quite frankly, plants that most of us know, dandelion, purslane, docks. I mean, we may not know exactly what they are, but we right. have, if anyone is outside to any degree out in their gardens or walking around with their dog or right. uh, you know, so on in the neighborhood. These are highly identifiable plants and that's what I really focus on. Like, like the mustards, there's so many different mustards and yes, they, mustard add, they add a lot of color and uh, spice yes. to salads and things of this nature and some of them are even good to cook with. Oh yeah, oh, definitely, definitely. So yeah, a lot of the mustards are uh, cold weather and um, spring. Uh, spring plants along with chickweed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've had a cold, uh, we just had a really cold, uh, you know, snap. snap. And so, a lot, you know, when the ground freezes, a lot of these plants really die back and really need to wait until April, May for them mm -hmm. to come out. But um, yeah, so a lot of the mustards are uh, basically they're kind of shaped like the arugula leaves. Mm -hmm. you know, they're kind mm -hmm. of squiggly and then they're, you know, kind of fatten at the. Dentine the, shape. Yes, dentine yeah. shape, yes, thank you. Um, and they, um, in the springtime, they're very strong. Um, bitter, but um, when you mix them with other salad greens, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of, um, you know, lose their, you right. know, pungency and so on. Once they flower, they became even more bitter and, mm -hmm. um, you know, unpalatable to some people. An, an example mm. of that would be the dandelion. I mean, they're very, very tasty. Uh, yes. Before they send up the stalks with the flowers and whatnot, but after that, I mean, they're when you pick them, you can, yeah, I mean, you can actually see the white lattic yeah, the sap. Sap coming out of the leaf, and that, that is what lends the, the bitterness, but that's what's really great for the liver, too. Yes, oh. yes. Um, Amazing. Yeah, you know, you know, dandelion, for example, is what's called a, a bitter, digestive bitter. Uh -huh. um, every culture in the world has a variation of uh, mm -hmm. bitters mm -hmm. uh, via a, you know, alcoholic drink, a tea, or a food. And what's really good about bitters, or bitter plants, or any bitter food, is that it really um, fires up the digestive enzymes mm -hmm. and helps the gallbladder relieve, uh, release bile and, you know, enhance digestion via right. the liver and right. so on. So it's, they're wonderful, you know, wonderful plant to incorporate into your diet, really aids in digestion right. and, uh, you know, settles down your, uh, 
you know, any discomfort that you, we sometimes have in right. the normal course of life. And what's I mean, even <clears throat> interesting, you just mentioned arugula, and uh, arugula is one of the few greens that actually falls into the crucifixus type of plant. And Oh, yes, yes. And arugula is very effective in removing excess estrogen from your system, whether it's you're a male or a woman. Huh. Um, it r removes the excess that's floating in your bloodstream. Really? So it binds to it. All cruciferous vegetables are, are great for this. I mean, along with helping with nitric oxide, oxide which is great for the heart, uh, and all your uh, arteries and veins and whatnot lining the endothelial cells and whatnot, but the, uh, it's really very helpful with the, um, the cruciferous nature of a root. Yeah, I didn't know that about yeah. the estrogen. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's just some of the stuff that you come across. You, I know you're a very prolific reader. Um, yes, and, yes. And, and you and I cross many paths. Definitely, definitely. Many, many different topics. Um, and every now and then, you're able to share with me, and I'm glad I could share with you. Yes, excellent. Um, yeah, in regard to nitric acid and so on, like beets. Beets mm. are a very, oh. you know, wonderful. I mean, they're cultivated, mm. but there is a um, there's a uh, wild relative called dead nettles or lamium, mm. and that's um, it's a less less common weed. Um, grows kind of like I'm well lamium lamium is a ground cover that's used in perennial gardening. It's like a um, um, Nettles, is it, yeah, lamium, yeah, lamium. So it can it can be um, a variegated, you know, ground cover, usually pink or sometimes yellow flowers. Uh -huh. But um, it's used in a ground cover in perennial gardening and uh, English gardens and right. shade gardens and wow. so on. But um, so the, the 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 wild version, dead nettles, it has a beet flavor and uh, is in the beet family, and I would imagine that helps with uh, nitric oxide it's, levels so, oh, in the yeah. bloodstream also. Right, and, and beets being a Great blood purifier, but, yes. but the thing is that the uh, that you just mentioned, I I wonder if people would be who um, have a very strong aversion to beets would be able to enjoy that. Uh, I don't think so because I've been on plant walks before where people have tried the the lamium or the dead nettles and yeah. it has a beet flavor and they just <laughs> won't eat it. They won't eat it. Okay, so. <laughs> just a thought. Yes, yeah. yes. I'm, my mind was thinking that some of the foods that are common in, in the supermarket, like radishes and stuff, used to be just wild things that we found. Mm -hmm. And they've been cultivated mm -hmm. yes. by us. But they, they were foraged. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And they learned not to pick all of them so that they would come up again yes. next year. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. uh, that was part of agricultural history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, um, tomatoes originated in Central and South America. There's mm -hmm. a variety of tomato that you can buy um, in the gardening, some of the garden catalogs. It's called Matt's Wild Cherry, and it's a little tiny cherry tomato that has the most unbelievable full flavor mm -hmm. of a you know full-sized tomato, and mm -hmm. um, and that's you know that's one of the original uh, varieties of tomatoes. And so I think when the Spanish and the uh, conquistadors came to Central America, they took the tomatoes back and. And, you know, they were grown in Italy, and everyone thinks tomatoes came from Italy, but really they're a Central American plant, uh -huh. as is uh, potatoes. You know, Peruvian right. potatoes. Right. You know, potatoes are originally from South America, and uh, you know, the purple ones are one of and the you original ones. You always think of Ireland. Ones. Yes, when you, yes. When you think of potatoes. Yes, right. yes. Right. Um, well, you just mentioned a purple potato too. It was very interesting. Brett was able to share some of his seed stock with me, and my granddaughters and I planted potatoes in the, the woven bags. Yes. Um, and we had the greatest time. Uh, we, we ended up digging over 70 potatoes out of the Really? Seat. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, some of the, the golden ones that you gave me were good size. The, uh -huh. the, the purple ones were smaller, yep. but, but very interesting. And um, what is that? Um, the constituent, the, the purple, the color is the Oh, um, the purple, um, oh my gosh. I know, it's on my tongue the, as well. The purple uh, chemical the constituent. Um, nope, I'm tongue-tied. Okay, well, it'll come to us as we, <laughs> as we keep talking. And, and then, oh, 
will come to us, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, the, the colors are what actually gives your immune system what it needs to even mm -hmm. be more proficient uh, in fighting viruses and uh, anaerobic bacteria. Mm -hmm. But in regard to what you said previously, like for example, crab apples. Mm -hmm. You know, crab apples were kind of the original apples, and they are, you know, coincidentally, you know, um, way more nutritious than oh, regular really? apples. So yeah, crab apples have 20 to 100 times more nutrition than a regular apple. And I think they originated in, um, um, oh my gosh, the sub uh, Eurasian continent, like, um, I'm, I'm gonna say this wrong. India, Actually, I'm not even gonna try, not yeah. India, but uh, like the Ukraine and Belarus and Bulgaria, oh, yes, like yes, kind of right. Southwest, right. Uh, you know, Asian mm -hmm. continent. But, um, yeah, there's a variety over there that has like 100 times more nutrition than a, a crab apple. I mean, than a regular apple. And, you know, for example, in I modern had, times. I had a crab apple tree. Yeah. And. Uh, you can't eat too many of them, though. No. They'll give you an upset no. stomach. They, they, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's because they're so full of nutrition. I made, ja <laughs> I made jams from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was highly productive. Yes. It got killed by a storm. Oh. Literally uprooted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. It just came to me. Try terpenes. Oh, triterpenes. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Right. That's the, that's the, it gives the color to the flesh of the plant, and those triterpenes are what boost mm -hmm. your immune system. But in regard to, like, um, I, I have a book. I'm not sure I have it with me, but um, uh, it's a book about varieties of fruits and vegetables that are way more nutritious than mm -hmm. others. So, for example, a Granny Smith apple, which is sour, you know, more like a crab apple than a sweet variety of apple, those are more nutritious than some of the newer varieties of the hybrids or the cultivated ones that are <coughs> so sweet. <coughs> Mm -hmm. You know, some some of these new apples are so sweet and yeah. and creamy or whatever that um, you know it's apples. like they're like eating a candy bar. You know, yeah. they're really sweet. So, you know, those are fine. People like them, but uh, Granny Smith apples well, Granny or Smith anything that is sour is uh, adds you know, in so general much to a salad. I mean, exactly. Yeah, it's just great. Yeah, toasted walnuts and yeah. uh, feta cheese or yeah. goat cheese, yeah. blue anything. So um, why don't we start this walk a little more? I mean, what would you, the average person, come across? You mentioned a few things like um, in, in the gardens or the beds or a lot of times the area that separates um, weeds or um, shrubs or bush mm -hmm. into a field. Sometimes there's a progression of uh, different types of um, plants that are easier for us mm -hmm. to find. Okay, so um, in my own personal vegetable garden, and then I have a friend in West Kingston who's got a 10-acre vegetable garden, and the plants that grow there profusely are uh, amaranth, mm -hmm. or uh, wild amaranth, or pigweed as it's called, mm -hmm. um, lamb's quarter, purslane, mm -hmm. uh, dandelion, and plantain. So mm -hmm. those are a lot of the common, most common weeds that will grow in any healthy um, right. soil that produces vegetables. Uh, or even sometimes this disturbed soil, like yes. along the paths or roads or... Yes, yes. Now, lamb's quarter is very interesting, um, besides the fact that the plant grows taller than myself. Mm -hmm. As does pigweed. <laughs> oh, really? Pigweed can get eight feet tall, and the wow. farmers hate it because the stem, when it gets really big in really healthy soils, it can uh, clog farm tractor equipment. Oh, my you know, like God. Like the brush cutters or the yeah. threshers. Very that, you know, high take in the fiber, weeds. Huh? Yes, extremely high in fiber. So, yeah, both of those get extremely tall. The amaranth is from the amaranth family. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you let it seed, it'll kind of have a head like some of the ornamental, like the purple. There's a purple amaranth that's mm -hmm. used in, in um, you know, gardens and right. um, ornamental gardens and so on. Sure. But um, yeah, so it's got those, you know, little tiny seeds you can harvest in the fall. Um, the leaves uh, in the beginning of the year are a great salad green. As mm -hmm. the plant matures, it will um, get, um, the leaves will get a little bit um, stronger flavored and larger. And then sure. in that case, you want to, you know, have it become a potter, meaning that you need to cook it, steam it, saute it, or cook it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the basic difference between a lot of these wild plants is you can, a lot of them you can just harvest and put in salads, mm -hmm. and then others you need to apply a little heat to them to break right. down the, you know, the fiber and the toughness and so on. Uh, lamb's quarter is called summer spinach. It is um, in the uh, quinoa family. Mm. So the little heads, uh, 
you know, have a, have kind of a quinoa uh, looking seeds, seeds when they finish. They just yes. kind of hang from the branches yes. and very prolific. And those leaves are, uh, taste like spinach. They're yeah. wonderful. So I put those in my salads, but you also I use it as an element to make wild plant pesto too. Well, I was just going to say, you make a pesto with basil. Yes. And lamb's quarters. Well, I do that, but well, I when I make a wild plant pesto, I usually don't use basil, but I'll use a whole compilation or a plethora of plants. So I'll use <laughs> lamb's quarter, dandelion, plantain, mm -hmm. the dots. Basically, you can make a wild plant pesto out of any greens um, because you're mm. just, um, you know, you're going to put them in the blender and really right. chop them up finely. And, right. Uh, and, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to get in touch with you for the show is just to share this information with people because when you incorporate different vegetable plants and materials, they all have their own elements they pick up from the soil. Yes. And so when you have a variety of plants lending yourself to a specific dish, yeah. it's extremely nutritious because you have so many different contributors yes. Yes. to the, yes. Uh, I. <coughs> <laughs> 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 oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's okay, Jessie. Take a moment. I noticed recently that ev everything in the 50s changed with agriculture. Mm -hmm. And they tried to get more out of the soil and they didn't recycle and recirculate. Right, the, rotate the crops. Yes, they, they, they just didn't do anything the way they did before. Mm -hmm. I used to love fresh tomatoes. Mm. For the last 25 years, I haven't tasted a real tomato, mm. Mm -hmm. no matter which variety they are, mm -hmm. because they haven't been letting the stems and plants and all of that decay and Get back compost. Into the soil, right? You know, they they make there is compost, but it's not the same as mm -hmm. the compost that they used to have on farms. Mm. And it's uh they even go to great lengths now people do to get what they call fulvic minerals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the soil. Mm -hmm. and that, that's actually ancient decayed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. humic acid and fulvic yeah. acid is basically when compost breaks down into tiny particles or I don't know what to say, atom, not atoms, but basically, yes, in modern agriculture now, between the weed killers and the insect pesticides, the soil is dead. So in, in, in giant agricultural farming, the soil is dead. All the trace minerals are gone. Yes, they've all, yes, and there's no microbial, there's no, there's no worms, there's no microbes or right, anything. They put NPK down as a fertilizer. Yes, it's just enough to support, well, right, it's just well, enough to support the green growth, but it, There is, I won't say the name of it, a tomato grower that must be using the old techniques because I tasted my old tomatoes mm -hmm. again. Well, then don't hesitate to say the name. I mean, that's, that'd be great it's to support somebody like cherubs. that. Cherubs. Cherubs? Cherubs. Yep, okay. And uh, well, that's they great. taste like an old tomatoes. Well, my did. organic friend down in West Kingston, uh, He's got real tomatoes too. I'll make sure you get some this year because okay. they're, they're really delicious. Yes, yes. But in regard, you know, in regard to the topsoil, one of the most interesting things. This is just an aside, but um, the original prairie um, prairie soil with the buffaloes in the Midwest and mm -hmm. so on. You know, you have like two or three feet of uh, topsoil, and this is you know this is virgin prairie. 
Land like that can absorb 12 inches of rain, like immediately, like a sponge. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the runoff and the mm -hmm. pollution that ends up in the Mississippi River, you know, is the nitrogen runoff and so on. It creates the dead zone where the Mississippi comes mm -hmm. out into the Gulf. Yeah, that's just all runoff from um, agricultural, agricultural products farms, that, right. that just are grown in dead soil. The, the mm -hmm. soil has no organic material, no microbes or whatever. But mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, 12, you know, think about soil that could absorb 12 inches of rain. That's like really, yeah, really they, something. They, there are more and more conscientious growers oh, definitely, now definitely. That, are, that are realizing they have to go back and they have to re you know, recirculate. Yep. And, uh, you know, the, ever since the peanut came out, that you know, they said it re-fertilizes the soil. The nitrogen, but it, nitrogen, nitrogen fixer, fixer, yeah. It yes, it does, but it doesn't replace all the trace minerals. No, right, no. right, right. But something like um, uh, wild clover or uh, there's some other plants that are very. And nitrogen fixes beans, nitrogen, yes, beans. Uh, yes, hairy yeah. vetch, yeah, yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah they're, they're good, but we right. still need the the trace minerals. Yeah, well, yeah, the reason, yeah. So you need you need a um, live uh, live soil for the microbes to break down right. the particles into e either even smaller pieces or um, elements, elements so the plants right. can take them up into their uh, mm -hmm. tissues. Right. So that's why you need live soil. And right. once you have really healthy soil, you said that a lot of farmers and growers are going back to traditional uh, ways, you're getting copious amounts of wild plants too, which are highly nutritious. Mm -hmm. One thing I did want to say, um, you know, one of the reasons wild plants are so nutritious, and in many cases more nutritious than cultivated plants, is they're not fertilized, they have to stand up to bug damage, UV radiation from yeah. the sun, and so on. So they, in general, are hardier, so they have more phytonutrients, higher vitamin content, and mm -hmm. so on. Um, Yes, so, yes. Well, I, I think it's great that you're able to, you know, pick up uh, and share with us all this information. Uh, I'd just like to know, is there a way that people can get in touch with you as far as if, you, if they have any questions or is there anything you want to share as far as a website or a way? Oh, sure. Well, my, my website still, as of, as of last time, is uh, needs some work. I'm going to revamp it. But you can get in touch with me by um, emailing me at um, brett at consciouscuisineri.com. Brett at consciouscuisineri.com. And... Uh, yeah, I'll put you on my mailing list. I'm going to uh, really get back to doing this. I'll, more. I'll hold you to those tomatoes. Oh no, positively, <laughs> positively. Yes, right, right, yes, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you might even have some of those growing in your own garden this year. Yes. Well, I don't have soil like my my organic friend down in West Kingston. Right. It's in the uh, kind of the valley where the train track goes by the Kingston train train station and the. Uh, the turf fields and so on, but that apparently is some of the best soil on the East Coast. He says uh -huh. like two to three feet of topsoil mm -hmm. with uh, well-drained, uh, you know, gravel underneath with an aquifer, and mm -hmm. he grows some of the best vegetables I've ever had in my life. I've been in the restaurant business on and off for 45 years. Oh yeah, they're exquisite. You sure? Um, but in regard to um, well, I know we're getting to the end, but wild plants. So, the, you know, one of the best ways to incorporate wild plants into a salad is rather than use, like a lot of the wild foods books will have a chapter on dandelion or purslane or lamb's quarter, and they'll have recipes mm. just for that one leaf. Mm -hmm. I have found the best way and the most delicious way to incorporate wild plants into a salad is to take five or 10 different types of the wild plants that are seasonal, use, a th and that would be a third of the component of the salad. A third, another third of the component would be um, romaine lettuce because it has a crunchy yeah. rib. It has the texture. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a nice contrast to the right. um, the smaller, more mineral dense leaves. flavored leaves. And then um, regular salad mix, whether from mm -hmm. your own garden or the farmer's market or the store. Or so you've got mix. a third, a third, and a third. Yes, yeah, spring mm -hmm. mix, exactly. Sure. And you put that together with a very light salad dressing. Um, one that I particularly like is a red wine and organic uh, fruit juice dressing oh. with olive oil, salt, and white pepper. So it's, it's basically half, and this is just in general, but you can tweak it if you like to cook and experiment. But if you, I usually make a pint container and I put in about half of uh, an organic fruit juice, 
about a quarter of red wine vinegar, a quarter of olive oil, and just salt and white pepper. So it's kind of a sour, mm -hmm. sweet dressing. It goes wonderfully with uh, this salad mix. Of course, you can add tomatoes, carrots, onion, mm -hmm. radishes, anything. Mm -hmm. You can grill meat, right, you know, right, right, protein right, right. on it, so on. Oh, Beans, and cheese, mm. it's endless. Yeah. I'm just going to add another one of those cruciferous vegetables that you can actually incorporate into your salad mix right there. And again, the benefits of helping with uh, the overexpression of estrogen mm -hmm. that we get from our meats. And I mean, most people don't realize that, that when you drink milk, mm -hmm. white milk, uh -huh. I mean, you're not getting just the protein and the sugars from that. You're also getting the estrogen from the cow. So you're actually drinking estrogen. Wow. And that's why it's so important to include cruciferous vegetables in, into your diet because it wicks them out. And the vegetable I was, I was going to share with you is the one you actually brought up earlier was radishes. Yeah. Most people don't realize that the radish is a cruciferous vegetable. And it's great to slice those up into because you get oh, that yeah. little peppery taste, you know, and it that's just kind of sparks up the salad very nicely. Yeah. And I'd I'm also like to take a moment. Them. Yes. I'm a big fan of radishes. Yeah, yeah. That's great that you brought it up like that. Well, I'd like to take a moment to thank everybody who's watching the show with us tonight and my friend Brett here and Josie. And uh, we'll just keep rolling with this. All right. So. Um, so in regard, so I just mentioned, you know, a simple way to incorporate uh, plants into a salad. Another way we were talking before, um, before we went on the air about how to, um, you know, Keep, keep wild plants over the um, winter or how to preserve. Oh, okay. So, you know, obviously if you've got a little freezer space, you can make wild plant pestos and freeze it. Yeah. Um, I also um, blanch some of the pot herbs, docks, uh, comfrey, plantain. I will just, you know, put them in boiling water for two or three minutes and then drain them and then freeze them. A very um, simple dish that I make when I do my cooking demos and so on is a, a pasta dish. So I really try and incorporate the wild plants into mm -hmm. dishes that are familiar to everybody. So a simple pasta dish would be onions, garlic, tomato, red bell pepper, olive oil, and then I'll use a pasta with some cannellini beans and I'll just put in a big bag of uh, chopped up wild plants right. and just cook that down. And so you've got like a, a, a very um, familiar pasta dish right. that you could use kale or chard or um, turnip mm -hmm. greens or whatever, but I've just used wild plants. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I do is um, I make a version of the uh, spinach pie, the Greek spanakopita. Oh yeah. But instead of, instead of spinach, I use all wild plants. Mm. And I've that been making that for years. It's absolutely delicious. You could make a, uh, a couple of sheets of that and freeze it for the winter. I have something to ask you right now. I want to get it in before we Time's forget. up? What's you know, that? I, you used to have these classes all the time where you would take people on walks. You would identify the mm -hmm. vegetables, uh, the flowers, the, the weeds, and you'd pick them and you get back to the, where you began to walk and you would actually prep them up and share the rest. I mean, do you see yeah, yourself I do doing that? that? Yes, yes. I have had to put that on hold for a, a few years. I have a uh, portable cooking unit, a tailgate unit, with three burners, and it goes uh, off of an LP gas tank. So yes, I can go out into the middle of a field or anywhere uh, where you know. What a gift! What yeah, a it's, gift. It's, it's fun. It's, yes, it's always been great. To, and then, of course, we also had a site where we even would have a bonfire afterwards too. Yes, so that was great. yes, yes. But yes, I'm completely mobile. I have done um, I've done a few over the years uh, farm dinners and then even a fundraiser for a local school. I did a plant walk around the property. This is a number of years ago. And uh, I have a seven gallon salad bowl and a giant fry pan. And I, I made a wild foods dinner for um, 55 paid uh, people and then another 25 uh, of the students and the parents and everybody. So I did a wild foods dinner for 80 people. Mm. I mean, it wasn't gourmet. It was kind of, you know, it wasn't yeah. like a five star chef making it, but it was delicious well, you, and you it was close. big fun. It was you big fun. Close. Hey, are there any books you want to share with us? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yes. While we have time, is, I'm always a book person. This is a very wonderful book. It's called The Wild Wisdom of Weeds by Katrina Blair. It is subtitled 13 Essential Plants for Human 
Urban Survival. Okay. It's a book about the 13 most common weeds on the planet and how nutritious they are. It's an absolute treasure. Everyone should have it. It would go a long way into uh, solving uh, food deserts and you right. know, vegetables. Uh, you know, so for, many for people, people are food concerned deserts. about you know being able to. You know. Yes. Yes. What else? Uh, have you? Northeast foraging. This is uh, you know we live in the northeast. Uh, here and then backyard foraging. Very, very cool. Anyway, it was a pleasure to be here. Right, okay, that's great. All right, and this here too also, the edible and medicinal plants. I mean, this, this is a great pictorial guide and, and he's used this 